as possible. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. My name is James Martinez. I am the admissions counselor for the University of Houston College of Pharmacy. Uh, and for many of you students, I've had an opportunity to, to work with you all in a variety of roles, either through admissions, recruiting, uh, helping you apply, things like that. Um, so throughout our sessions, we hope to be able to expand your knowledge of the field of pharmacy, but more specifically, the University of Houston College of Pharmacy. And today, we hope that we can do that as well uh, with a PharmD curriculum session uh, that will really be presented by a host of our faculty members. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dean Coyle uh, for a short introduction. Hello, guys, and welcome um, to our curricular overview today. Um, as you guys, when you interviewed, um, I went kind of over the curriculum as a whole. Um, and I'm going to just kind of summarize the curriculum before the faculty actually come on and really give the nitty gritty of, of what the curriculum is. Um, but um, if you can go ahead and advance the slide, um, James, to the first one. All right. So as we talked about when you interviewed, we have an integrated curriculum. And really what we do is in that first year, we really kind of hit the ground running um, to get, get you to feel what is it to be a, a pharmacist, as well as then bringing in some of those basic sciences that you guys had in, um, in undergrad and getting everybody kind of on the same page. So the first year of the curriculum has a lot of the biochemistry, the physiology um, within there, but then also brings in some of that pharmaceutical sciences such as pharmaceutics and calculations, um, how to communicate with that social and behavioral aspects of pharmacy. And then one of the, the crew things, we want to really give you that hands-on experience. You learn a lot of things in the classroom, but then that applies into our skills lab. And so pharmacy skills program one is actually doing compounding or with a PCCA um, where within the first few weeks that you come in, you will actually be making that pharmaceutical compound. The rest of your second or your first year, um, again, some of your foundational sciences of immunology, pharmaceutics um, too, more physiology. And then we kind of introduce you to what is going to come within the next year. And we have a class that's foundations in medical um, chemistry, microbiology, and receptor action. That's really a lot of mouthful, and we call it FEMRA. And that really introduces you, brings you from organic chemistry into medicinal chemistry, kind of brings you into what pharmacology will be, as well as gives you a foundation in microbiology. We also do some of the laws and that fundamentals of pharmacy practice. And with patient assessment and self-care, this is where you guys will get, uh, if you remember us talking, some of that feeling of being a pharmacist, where how do I assess a patient? What, how do I apply um, patient assessment and choosing stuff from a self-care and over-the-counter products um, in preparation for that, uh, that summer between your first and second year? You also will be immunized certified um, after this first year. And we also have that skills program where you're going to practice a lot of these things um, from the didactic courses. Between your first and second year is when you do that first introduction, introductory pharmacy practice experience in the community, and you're going to get a lot of information on that here in just a few minutes. And we also have a longitudinal course in patient and medication safety and informatics um, that you take, and that's an online course. The next thing you know, you're in that second year, and if you could go ahead and forward the slide. In the second year, this is when our integration truthfully happens with the curriculum. And that's when we get into the modules. And the modules are really bringing that piece of the puzzle, all the pieces of the puzzle together with pharmacology, medicinal chemistry, um, pharmacotherapy, toxicology, over-the-counter medications, patient um, assessment that comes in and you do it in a disease state type manner. So our modules, um, we always use the example in the P2 fall that you have the renal module, the GI module, and the respiratory module. And those are broken up into five-week courses. So there's small courses that run throughout that full semester, and they build upon each other at the renal module, um, and then you go to the GI, and then you go to the respiratory. 
we kind of the glue of the whole entire curriculum throughout the P2 and P3 um, year is what we call our module related skills labs or MERSLs. And that's your practicing everything that you've learned. And, we, and um, Dr. Sarati will actually talk about that in just a few minutes. We also have the leadership and principles of IPE, um, really setting that foundation of um, interprofessional education, as well as learning your leadership style or your professional style, because um, as a pharmacist, you are a leader. You also have the literature evaluation course throughout the, uh, that semester, as well as pharmacokinetics, that math course, as we talked about, that it um, is what kind of sets us apart from other healthcare professionals. In the spring semester, um, we have your pharmacoeconomics and hospital management, as well as a lot of the other integrated modules of endocrine, men's and women's health, and then your cardiovascular. Going back to the fall semester really quick, that is the skills program three is where you'll practice doing journal clubs, as well as that's where you'll do the sterile compounding um, or the IV room. Again, we're getting you ready for that P2 summer where you'll do another introductory pharmacy practice experience, this time in that acute care setting. Um, you also will have the opportunity to take one, at least one of your electives that are required within the curriculum. And before you know it, you've moved into the third year. If I could have been, thank you, James. Um, and the third year, really, again, more of the modules building upon each other. So you have the neurology, immunology, and then the, my favorite infectious disease modules within that um, third year of the fall. You also do another management course. And one of the things you'll see throughout um, uh, the curriculum is each year you will have some form of management because again, being a manager, understanding the different practice environments of pharmacy is very important in practicing whatever setting you are in pharmacy. You see that Mersel there again, the glue that Dr. Sarati will talk more in depth about. And before you know it, you're in your third year, the third year or um, third year spring. Um, and it looks a little bit different than the other um, semesters in that that's the semester that we're getting you ready to go out on your advanced pharmacy practice experiences. So you will have your law course, um, very important to, in practice. And we want to do that law course as close to practice as possible so you can apply it. Um, and then when you take the MPJE to be a pharmacist, that'll be fresher in your mind. You also have the opportunity, you have to at least do one elective in this spring semester, but you can do two electives um, of a, an area that you're interested in. Maybe it's cardiology, infectious diseases, oncology. There's a variety of different ones you can take. Um, the other modules in that spring semester are the hematology and oncology. Our students just had their final on that today. Um, and they'll start Monday on their psychiatric module um, that will run another five weeks. And then that last module, even though it's not called a module, is that complex problems. And it's really a team-based or teamwork um, approach of really getting you ready for appies, getting your confidence ready for appies, where you'll really do critical thinking and evaluation of a complex problem um, in solving that complex problem that won't have a right or wrong answer, but you have to solidify what answer you came up with. And that really gives you, um, pulls in stuff that you've been doing in Mersels and really kind of gives you that confidence in what we would call that bridge before you get into your fourth year. And I'm not going to go in depth in your fourth year, but as we talked about when you interviewed, that fourth year is a full year of going every six weeks into a different type of practice setting with those um, required um, practice advanced pharmacy practice experiences, as well as electives. And again, your experiential group, um, Dean Ordonez is going to talk about that here in just a little while. So again, Dr. Coyle, you met me um, when you interviewed. Um, we're so excited to have you as part of our family and really hope that today helps you understand the curriculum a little bit better. Thank you so much, Dean Coyle. All right, Dr. Sarti. Yes, good afternoon, everyone. So good to see each of you, though it's virtual. And um, I'm Nara Surti, Clinical Associate Professor here at the college. And I will be talking to you about skills program today and a little bit about the modules filling in for my colleague, Dr. Sofian. 
All right. So we talked about this with Dr. Coyle. And so this is just a snapshot, took everything else out. And uh, here we're just looking at those skills and module related skills labs, MERSELs, we call them lovingly. So we have skills programs one, two, three. And then you see in this snapshot an overlap, right, in the P2 fall, where you have skills program ongoing still, but then we also bring in MERSELs. So we'll talk, uh, because we're focusing right now on the P1, we'll focus on skills program one and two. Next slide, please. All right, so here we have the arrow pointing at 40 to 50, that's your skills course. And so the hands-on experience, right? We don't wait till later on in the curriculum. I think the coolness factor here is, uh, as Dr. Coyle said, you will see yourself compounding within a week or two of being a P1 pharmacy student. So we start with that active learning right away, uh, both in the didactic portion as well as uh, definitely in the skills program. So I think of skills program one as having a lot of C based, so letter C, right? You see C for compounding communications calculations and the others don't necessarily start with C. So <laughs> we'll just call it other, but they're all important. So with compounding, we have yeah, some of you will be excited that you are going to compound a suppository, trochee, and all of these different um, formulations. So it's it's pretty exciting. Communication is a huge part of being a pharmacist and getting ready for practice. So uh, you'll start out with learning how to communicate with a patient. So more in the layman's term, but then also start uh, learning about how to communicate with other healthcare providers. So we'll pull in medical terminology that you can use and we'll do lots of role plays. Uh, so bring in your actor, actress, uh, spirit. And if you don't have it, don't worry, it will be instilled. And then calculations, uh, so calculations is super important in making sure we dose our patients appropriately, whether they're peds or geriatric patients, right? And so you'll get lots of practice from the P1 year onward. And then it supports some of the other didactic courses. Uh, so the other one example there would be, there's some physiology labs, so it does support some of the basic sciences that are there. And I guess we'll move on to skills programs too. Yeah, so here uh, you'll see the theme looking at, uh, we want you to have this before you go to your first uh, experimental in that summer. And so some of you may have had experience in the community pharmacy, but our goal is to then bring everybody on the same page and have you start thinking as a pharmacist to be. And uh, so uh, this lab helps to do that as well. So you'll see transferring a prescription from one setting to the next. Uh, you'll also do uh, order, uh, entry and those type of things. You'll see the workflow in the community setting. Self-care and over-the-counter, uh, there we do a lot of uh, practice with, you know, there are tons of Tylenol products, but uh, we'll then hone into that they're not all the same, right? They may have different active ingredients. You get a lot of practice at that. Patient assessments, so here you'll practice uh, immunization technique. That's a huge part of uh, the labs here, but also how to measure blood pressure, other vitals. And then big part of is not just how to measure, but how to interpret, because that's a lot of what we do, is do we understand when the temperature is high or low? So we do a lot of uh, case-based learning, uh, even in uh, the P1 year. And other, again, physiology are some labs you'll have. And this will set up a good foundation for what's coming in your future semesters. I'll pause there, and then we'll pick up skills a little later on. All right, thank you, Dr. Sarti. Dr. Tolson. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Happy to see you all here today. I'm Dr. Tolson. Uh, I, you'll see me mostly during your P3 and P4 year, but I do teach a couple of fun lectures. At least I think they're fun lectures uh, during the P1 year. So I'm here to give a little bit more um, of my perspective or the faculty perspective of when, we, uh, when we're teaching you in the P1 year in particular. Uh, next slide, please. 
Perfect. Uh, so as you've seen from Dr. Surathi and Dr. Coyle, the, uh, we start you off with a very robust curriculum from day one. We've got you actively learning, preparing to be a pharmacist. And what we're doing is really trying to set you up with foundations for future courses and, and your practice once you actually get out there and start working. Um, or even during your, your IPIs, which is the summer after your P1 year. So we want you to have, you to have a really good foundation. Um, with that, we're doing you know, your basic sciences, making sure that you understand you know, the chemistry behind everything. We're introducing you to healthcare uh, and really how the system works. And we're also working a lot on your soft skill development. And by that, I mean things like your people skills and something that's maybe not as measurable, but being able to take care of your patients in the best way possible for them. Uh, next slide, please. And so to do that, um, we actually present y'all with a lot of um, contemporary topics, right? You're part of the profession at this point. We want to make sure that you are um, ready to go out there and practice as soon as possible. And again, take care of your patients in the best way for them. Um, so we, we consider you part of the profession, your student pharmacist, and we want to provide you with um, things like current issues so that when you get out there, you know how to handle them. We want to make sure that we bring you up to speed on everything that's going on in the profession. Um, so again, your main focus is going to be caring for your profession or caring for your patients and advancing the pr profession. Um, a couple of the the two lectures that I provide for you during the P1 year are going to be um, LGBT cultural competence along with uh, generational differences. And uh, I also go over medication histories and medication reconciliations with you. Again, those are going to be softer skills, learning how to talk to your patients from different backgrounds uh, and, and how to get as much uh, of the best information you can from them. So we're really trying to prepare you, especially here in Houston, one of the most diverse cities in, in the country, to we want to prepare you to take care of a diverse patient population that you're going to see out in the real world. And so um, that's really my goal as faculty, and I know everyone else's goal is really to prepare you for that as best we can by setting you up with solid foundations in your B1 year. Thank you very much, Dr. Tolleson. All right, Dr. Hatfield. Hi, guys. Welcome. Glad you guys could join us today. Uh, my name is Kathy Hatfield. I'm, uh, uh, you see me a little bit throughout the curriculum. Um, I teach some in the second year, but what I'm going to talk about now is team steps in interprofessional education, um, which is something that um, I'm very passionate about. But another part of my job that I won't be talking about today is introductory pharmacy practice experiences. And that's what Dr. Tolleson was just talking about in the summer after your first year. And actually in the summer after your second year, you do um, uh, and what we call an IPI. Uh, short for introductory pharmacy practice experience, one in the community, one in the hospital. But I think Dr. Rodonez is going to be talking about them later today. So my focus today is on interprofessional education. So if we could advance, thank you. So what is interprofessional education? It's, it's really learning to work with all of the different professions in healthcare. And one of the definitions here I added to the slide was it occurs when two or more professions learn about from and with each other to enable effective collaboration and improve healthcare outcomes. Because when you think about it, if, if we as pharmacy students are learning here and medical students are learning here and nursing students are learning here, but then all of a sudden we're all thrown together and expected to learn to work together in an actual setting with a patient, you know, that's not terribly efficient or effective and it can cause uh, detriments to patient safety. So my goal, uh, and my job is actually to try to bring you all together with other disciplines throughout our curriculum so you actually learn a common language, you learn how to speak up, you learn what is your role and your responsibility and how do you fit in, but more importantly, others learn about what is your role and your responsibility and how you fit in, and you can all learn how to use each other, how to communicate and create a common language so that everyone is on the same page. And they've actually shown that having really good communication and learning to work together actually improves patient safety. Next slide. So TEAM STEPS uh, is an acronym for uh, what I have at the bullet, TEAM Strategies and Tools to Enhance Performance and Patient Safety. So TEAM STEPS is a really, really large program that is evidence-based, meaning they've actually done a lot of research on this of how to create an effective team. OK, so these teams were originally researched in uh, military environments and aviation environments 
about how we can get teams together to be effective and communicate effectively. Well, healthcare teams are very similar. And so this team steps is actually based on research from other areas of how to form effective teams. So what we have here, uh, I think you guys can see my mouse, correct? Oh, you probably can't because I'm not sharing. Never mind. Sorry. So in the middle, we see um, four colored boxes, kind of. There are maybe more trapezoids um, with leadership, situation monitoring, mutual support, and communication. And what the research shows is that those four are teachable, learnable skills. If we can teach students how to become effective communicators, how to offer mutual support and receive mutual support, how to be effective leaders, how to monitor the situation uh, of everybody in their team, that it actually helps the patient care team in the circle. And then we get the outcomes in the, um, uh, in the outer uh, uh, um, angles of the triangle. So we get the outcome of better performance, better attitudes on our rotations, and more knowledge. And so all of that are the things we're striving for when we move out into patient care. Next slide. So what I've done and is part of the curriculum, and this is why I kind of see you throughout, is there are several places throughout the curriculum where we build and we learn to work together with other disciplines. Um, we start in the P1 year where I go through team steps. You have me probably about five hours uh, between lecture and lab where you're learning about ways to become effective communicators. And then we go through several other interprofessional experiences that build, some of them more, more building on team steps, some of them more building on relationships with other professions. Uh, and we go throughout where uh, some of these are occurring at the school where you're actually walking through a case and others are occurring at the clinic where you're actually having to learn to take care of patients with someone. Uh, and so that's kind of what I do. So it's, it's very exciting. It's very passionate about it. And um, I look forward to uh, sharing it with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hatfield. All right, so here, uh, we'll start talking about more of the integration. So we talked about modules, we then talked about you will have some longitudinal courses, and then you have what Dr. Quill referred to as the GLU, the module related skills labs or MERSALs, right? So what we decided to do, instead of telling you more about it, we thought it may help to then walk you through uh, an example. So picture yourself in this module of infectious diseases, and that is in your P3 fall semester, right? So in the module, uh, and most modules are laid out in the same manner, where you will go through um, learning about medicinal chemistry, you'll learn about pharmacology, you'll learn about um, therapeutics, you'll learn about pharmacokinetics as needed, you'll learn about uh, pharmaco genomics as needed. You'll learn about toxicology as it applies as well. So here in this example, and I'm sure as you're looking at this, maybe bringing back memory from your um, organic chemistry days, and some of you may be uh, completing that as we speak. So here is what we call medicinal chemistry. We're looking at this medication called vancomycin, and it may be familiar to uh, some of us. And so here, you know, in uh, when uh, one of our professors, that is Dr. Williams, when he talks about medicinal chemistry, you'll see his passion come out. It will talk about the bonds, and it will ask you: Is it hydrophilic? Is it lipophilic? Is it water insoluble or water soluble? Right. And then when you look at the structure itself here in this example, it's pretty big, and that will help understand a lot of what's coming. So then we'll go to P call. So then we'll bring in another faculty and uh, we can go to the next slide in pharmacology. So here, one of the main focuses in pharmacology is thinking about how does this drug work? Okay, where does it work? So in infectious diseases, we'll have the medication, we have the host, AKA humans in this case, right? And then third, we have the bug or the bacteria in this case. So we have three players. So we wanna know where does this 
medication work. So the mechanism of action. So it goes into, well, it works on the cell wall and I won't, I, we won't go into the details, I promise. But I'm, I am also, I also practice in the area of infectious diseases. So I had to hold myself back that I don't go into all the details because you need to learn about all the other things as well. Okay, so that's mechanism of action. If we understand the structure, the mechanism, it often helps us understand adverse effects. Some we just have to learn, there's no rhyme or reason, but certain adverse effects are based on how the medication works and the downfall of that, right? And so here, those are listed for you. So you'll get that in pharmacology. Then uh, next. So vancomycin, this particular medication, we do talk about pharmacokinetics in the module itself. So when we think pharmacokinetics, you know, you may be wondering what is that? It's simply four things we focus on. Absorption, distribu distribution, and metabolism excretion. So basically, how does a drug get into the body? And once it does, what does it do? And how does it clear from the body? That's essentially the idea behind kinetics, right? And so we'll, we'll get into that of this medication and we'll talk about how it differs between a child and then an elderly patient. And then we talk about what that all means. And once we have all of that foundational basic science, we'll bring in um, the application piece. Next slide. Okay. So vancomycin, you'll learn, is a very broad spectrum antibiotic, and it has many uh, utility, right? It's used for different uh, infections. One such infection then is meningitis or bacterial meningitis in certain types. So when Dr. Sofian talks about her therapeutics uh, lecture on bacterial meningitis, the expectation is what you learned about all of the medicinal chemistry, pharmacology, and the kinetics, you bring all of that back and apply it to the therapeutics of bacterial meningitis. So here is a chart of uh, based on age, different bacteria that's associated with meningitis. And then we'll quickly learn that you can't just use wink because it won't take care of all the bugs that are listed there. And so we have to use it in combination, right? So that is a, an example of how you see it come full circle in therapeutics. And we won't stop there. So to make sure this is clear, we'll take it to the next step on the next slide. And then that will show us, well, okay, you no, know, we have covered a lot of information and don't worry, all of this doesn't get uh, done in one hour. It will be a few hours, right? Um, and then we bring in a case to see if uh, what we've talked about makes sense. And so here is a case of a 60 year old male. And the question there is, the, the team has suggested that these are the antibiotics we want for this patient. The question to us as students is, do we agree with this regimen or not? Okay. And you'll be able to answer that with all of that understanding. All right. Uh, so at this time, uh, there will be a lot of uh, other things that we count on that you learn outside of the modules, the longitudinal courses. So Dr. Hatful will talk about how all of that comes together. So the question that uh, Dr. Sarkey just raised was, you know, is this a is this a good um, regimen, and do we do we like what the doctor has uh, recommended? And so one of the courses that I help oversee is something called literature evaluation, where you're actually taught to evaluate and understand the literature. We do a little bit of searching. You may or may not have heard of PubMed, um, but it's something where you can search bacterial meningitis, uh, which is something that you might learn in another class. And we're going to come here to try to find some literature about what are the best regimens to treat bacterial meningitis. There are three different places you can look, three different kind of umbrellas of places you can look for information, one of them being your textbook, okay? But textbooks only come out every so often. And so the information in your textbook is often the most outdated. Um, it's not easily updatable, okay? Uh, and then there's secondary literature, which is like PubMed, and there are many more uh, secondary databases where you can go and search to try to find updated information. 
And then next slide. And then you can find some primary literature. OK, this actually is a review article doesn't quite fit uh, the definition of primary literature, which is new research, but it, it fit the, the premise of of this presentation because we're trying to find guidelines about is this um, regimen that the doctor recommended appropriate. And so we're able to actually find this article published within the last year of what are the appropriate regimens for bacterial meningitis? And do we like what the physician is recommending? And so you can come here and I think, you know, you, you find the age range or something that is specific and you can see well, what are they recommending? Okay. And so that's kind of how a longitudinal course fits into um, more of the modular courses so that we try to tie it together. And the goal of literature evaluation is for you to actually be able to find these articles and really read them and understand them and be able to say at the end whether or not they were done well, uh, whether or not the study was appropriate, they had the, the right number of subjects, and whether or not they came to the correct unbiased conclusions. Thank you. I think I turn it over to, um, not sure who. Yeah, so we'll talk about, uh, again, the MRSLs here. So because we're using the example of the infectious disease, so again, we're in that P3 fall semester. So you've gone through MRSL 1, you've gone through MRSL 2, and now we're in MRSL 3. So by the time you come to MRSL 3, you have a lot of modules under your belt, right? So MRSL has few goals in mind. One is how do we keep building your skill set to work up patients, whether that's in a community pharmacy setting, whether that's in an inpatient setting, or whether that's in an ambulatory care setting, or anything in between, or what is also known as transition of care. So we're working on that piece throughout. By the time you get to the P3 year, because you've gone through so many modules, we don't want you to forget the critical things you have learned. So our job is to help you keep applying that in what we call integration, okay? And so the third goal, okay, so patient workup skills in many different forms, integration, keep that going. And third is, well, these modules are five weeks or so long. And so you're learning a lot of information and we wanna make sure that foundation is good. So we bring in the new content and finds way for you to apply the newly learned content so, um, so you have that strong base. So in order to do that with the example of vancomycin, you did all that in the module you, we had the longitudinal course to also help us more from the literature piece, evidence-based medicine. So now we then bring all of that to lab with you, right? And then we will do something, and this activity here example is consult service. So in this consult service, uh, you the scenario is you are the pharmacist or the pharmacy, uh, student pharmacist on the team, and we're, at, we're consulted to dose vancomycin or monitor vancomycin, okay, this particular medication. So this first consult is about initial dosing. So we have a, a, a patient that's fairly, uh, an elderly patient, right, 88 years old. So how we dose, we had to take into account her renal status. So your kinetics and all of that comes back. Okay, we'll go to con the next one. So yeah, so there are many different consults we do that day. And so you get to pick up on key things that you've learned. So here we're not asked to dose. Here we're asked to monitor. The patient's already on this medication of uh, vancomycin. So, and then some of the monitoring's back, right? So we call this therapeutic drug monitoring. So uh, we are asked to assess. And uh, so you'll do that and then we'll move on. Right, so then that so that's a consult service. We do a lot of full patient workup. And so I wanted to share a little bit of what we do. Now we try to bring some of what you'll see in terms of simulations in the classroom or in the lab setting. So here we have EHR go and I believe that's the next slide. 
Yeah, so we use a program. So we are very fortunate to have an awesome IT team and we work very closely with them. We try to bring technology into your day-to-day -day learning. One such tool we use in the lab setting is simulated electronic medical record. So you'll then, some of you may uh, be working and have seen this. And so others will also then get this in, in your curriculum where you'll click on different tabs and the demographics, uh, medications, labs, vitals, and all these different tabs. And then you'll uh, collect information on a particular patient and then come up with your own assessment. Um, and then you'll come up with a recommendation as a pharmacist and we'll go from there. So the vanco you know, vancomycin is such a big antibiotic that uh, we see that in many, many different cases we do throughout the curriculum. So this is one such example that we do. And I think uh, I have one or two more. So just to, we have, sometimes when we do an example, right? It gets very specific and then I get passionate about Wank. So we're gonna pull back and give you a big picture. So the big picture is this, at the very center of Mersel's, the modules and really the entire curriculum, it is to help you um, with critical thinking and clinical reasoning, right? As we know in medicine, information change at a very rapid pace. And we have seen that with COVID and all of that. So we cannot teach you, and it wouldn't be possible for you to learn every single disease state that's out there. But if we teach you and help you and guide you through clinical reasoning, critical thinking, the soft skills, all of that packaging will then help you resolve a situation as a clinician, no matter what setting you practice in. And that is the ultimate goal. So we take all of these different um, disciplines and we package it together to get you ready for experiential. And we'll go to the next one. All right, so thank you so much, Dr. Sarthi. Uh, Dr. Adonis? Yes, hello, good afternoon, everybody. And, um, I want to discuss the experiential programs here at the University of Houston College of Pharmacy. I'm Nancy Giordanis. I'm Assistant Dean for Experiential Programs, and I oversee the basically the crux of where you will be practicing your skills and knowledge that you have learned in the didactic program uh, into the real world uh, scenarios. So for the, if you can go, all right, so if we go ahead and click on to, I think there's a couple of, um, there you go. So this is an overview of our um, APIs and IPIs. And so um, for the IPIs, which is the Introductory Pharmacy Practice Experiences, um, which Dr. Hatfield is the director of, you have two IPIs, one that you will do after the summer of your P1 year is introductory community pharmacy practice. Uh, in this case, you will be in a community setting, community pharmacy setting. You will be doing a four week rotation with the community pharmacist preceptor, um, and you will be obtaining 160 hours already towards your licensure. So then once you're done with that, uh, in, you will go on to your P2 year, learn more knowledge and skills, and then after your P2 year, you will be doing your introductory to institutional pharmacy, and this is in a hospital setting. You will be doing a four-week rotation similar to the intro community pharmacy rotation, and you will obtain 160 hours um, of licensure hours. So once you're done with your IPIs, you will go into your P3 year, and again, gaining more knowledge and skills so that when you hit your API year, um, you will have had all your didactics that um, the faculty previously that have spoken um, have wonderfully described to you. And hopefully you will be appy ready. So in your appy year, which is your fourth year, you'll be doing seven appies. Uh, and appy stands for Advanced Pharmacy Practice Experiences. Each appy is six weeks each at 240 hours per appy. So you'll be gaining 1,680 hours for a total of 2,000 internship hours which will go, go towards your licensure. 
So after you're done with your appies, hopefully you will be ready to practice, but you can go on to work in a pharmacy setting and or you may seek further training and postgraduate training in a residency or fellowship. Uh, in some cases, some students um, go ahead and get a master's program or a PhD. Next slide, please. So where will you be doing your IPI and API sites? So for the IPI, um, you'll be doing it in Wisconsin and surrounding areas. We have sites in Beaumont, Dallas, Fort Worth, and Rio Grande Valley. And so similar to your API sites, you're going to be doing it in those cities too. But the APIs also, um, you can apply to do internships at the FPA. Uh, we have Indian Health Service rotations in Alaska, Arizona, and New Mexico. You can also apply to industry rotations, uh, which can be um, in New Jersey. And then, of course, we're at the heart of Houston, where you will be in the Texas Medical Center, um, which is a picture right there. And you have access to the major health systems here in the Houston area, not just at the Texas Medical Center, but the surrounding areas also. Next slide, please. So for your APIs, you have four required rotations. So you have internal medicine, advanced hospital, advanced community, and ambulatory care. So internal medicine and advanced hospital are your uh, inpatient or um, institutional settings, the advanced community, ambulatory care rotation. Um, and ambulatory care rotations, Dr. Tolson, who um, spoke earlier, will be your API director or your outpatient setting. So you should get a variety of um, diverse experiences in diverse practice sites. Next slide, please. So then you will also have three electives. So for your electives, two must be patient-focused electives, and the third elective could be a non-patient-focused or patient-focused elective. Next slide, please. So your API patient-focused electives, again, are a variety. We have a very robust experiential program where we can um, offer you many, many different types of rotation, almost overwhelming for some of the students. Um, and so the current P3 students are choosing their APIs for next year. Um, but you have cardiology, uh, you can have uh, community pharmaceutical care if you want to go into compounding, um, critical care, emergency medicine. If you're inter interested in veterinary pharmacy, you can go to Texas A&M um, Veterinary School and do a rotation there. Um, in addition, if you like specific patient populations such as geriatrics, we have those rotations too. Next slide, please. As well as um, infectious disease, we have um, great faculty in infectious disease, um, in psychiatry, oncology. Uh, and again, if you want to go the other spectrum of patient population, you can have a pediatric rotation. Uh, in several sites, uh, of which one of them is the world-renowned Texas Children's Hospital. Next slide, please. So for the non-patient-focused electives, again, we have a variety, and we have um, made this even more robust because we need to look at the current pharmacy practice and make sure that our students have opportunities to do rotations in there, such as pharmacy informatics, med safety, um, pharmaceutical industry. Some of our students are doing rotations with Bristol-Myers Squibb, um, Gilead. So the opportunities are there for you to explore other avenues of pharmacy outside of the, the clinical practice. Um, in addition, we have legal and regu regulatory affairs um, rotation with the FDA or even some of the organizations, national organizations with the um, phar pharmacy. Um, also, you can do a rotation with the Texas State Board of Pharmacy in Austin, Texas. Um, nuclear pharmacy, this one is in the Rio Grande Valley, as well as doing research with our faculty uh, or research with other preceptors. So hopefully these type of rotations, both the patient focus and non patient focus can give you um, exposure to different types of pharmacy practice so that when it's time for you to decide which path you want to go to as far as your pharmacy career path, you have enough information um, to have in your hand to make a decision for your future. And I think that's it for me. 
All right, that's perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Ordonez. Um, now we want to take some time. Uh, we have about 15 minutes to open up the floor for a question and answer, and really just an opportunity for students to have a discussion with our faculty members here. Um, so I encourage any and all of you to either unmute or um, use the chat box. If you have questions that you'd like to ask, we are available here to answer your questions, and we can begin doing that now. And I'll, I'll go ahead and uh, I'm not seeing any in the chat yet. So um, maybe for Dean Coyle, um, what are maybe some general questions or concerns that, that incoming students have when uh, thinking about the curriculum? I think that's a very good question. I mean, you're coming in. I think one of the biggest things is that transition as you go from an undergrad program and then coming into a professional program. As we presented the whole entire curriculum, it sounds intense and, and it is intense. It's, it's, a, it's a large um, jump as you go from undergrad into the pharmacy curriculum. So one of the things I think that's really important as you look at it is be prepared to learn how to study maybe differently than you studied previously. I think the other thing is don't wait and think I'm just going to do better on the next test or I'm just going to do better on the next quiz. You have to keep up and reach out to your coordinators um, and use the tutors, use your student services as much as possible. It's, it, it, like I said, it's an intense curriculum, but it's a very doable curriculum and, and you will graduate with the most awesome um, baseline of knowledge prepared to go into any area of pharmacy um, that you want to. So great question. And, and please, anybody else want to add to what I said? Thank you, Dr. Coyle. I believe Miriam, you had a question? Okay, perfect. So there it is to the chat box. In terms of IPIs, during the summer of P1 at a community pharmacy, oh, it cut off. I don't see the whole thing. Uh, I got summer, it. Okay. Okay. So do we get assigned a specific pharmacy or is it our responsibility to find a pharmacy with a preceptor? So I, I go ahead, Dr. Hector. No, you, we, we both kind of oversee uh, IPIs, uh, um, but you get assigned a specific site. You don't have to go search your own. In fact, we discourage that. We um, work with the uh, district managers in the area and a few other areas outside of the Houston um, region. And uh, you get assigned a specific site and a specific preceptor, um, but you might work with other preceptors at the store, but you do get assigned that. And we do uh, the location and the assignment for you. And, and just to add on to that, it's the same thing for your app year. Um, we work with you to try to build your schedule with sites that we already have existing because we've got such a robust offering that, you know, um, we've got a lot to, that you can choose from. So we, we assign your appy sites as well in the fourth year. There was another question that asked if we could speak more about the tutoring services available. And um, Dr. Wynn is actually on here. She probably would be a better person to talk about those. Um, so I'm gonna let her do that. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you everyone for joining. Thank you our presenters for wonderful information on our curriculum. In regarding to our tutoring program, we do um, actually hire peer tutors, meaning these are current pharmacy students that have excelled in um, their courses and actually been nominated by faculty members to work with a diverse um, the number of students at all different skills levels and knowledge base levels. Their goal is to work in groups or and even now we've done a lot of one-on-one -on -one tutoring. We've kind of allowed it during um, in-person as well as via Zoom or via Teams and many different platforms, whatever platforms that's available to the students. So, um, so far we have had last fall, we did 40 in-person Zoom group sessions uh, for our students. And that's just the group. There was a lot more one-on-one -on -one that each student could reach out to the tutors themselves. So um, in the beginning, we have like a meet and greet session so that all students can um, know the tutors that um, are available and then get contacts information for each of the tutors and then also a schedule of any of our group sessions um, that we would have. So we would encourage a lot of our students to come to the tutoring sessions. Even if you have questions, they can also 
um, these are your upperclassmen, right? They're the second year, third year, sometimes even fourth year students. So you can even ask them questions about how did you get through this course? What were some study strategies? And they are very, very willing to work with um, students to help, to help them um, do well. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Dr. Wynn. What other questions do we have from those in attendance? All right, so that's a new question for me. So I'll let one of you jump in and take that one. That's a very great question. Um, act, actually, Dr. Sarati, do you want to answer? You look, you you have this knowing look, and I I, I don't want to take over. Do you want to answer that? <laughs> Go ahead and start. I'll feel free to add. Feel free, Dr. Coyle. <laughs> All right. So, um, in a sense of um. We used to have what we used to call an integrated exam where all classes all were on a one day exam. So no, in that respect, but integration means, um, and I, this will kind of come back to the original question that Mr. Martinez brought up. Um, what is different about pharmacy school um, compared to maybe undergrad? Every little morsel that you are learning is going to integrate upon itself and grow into your base of knowledge. So with respect to all of the courses, each of the stuff that you're learning will play a part in each of the courses throughout the curriculum. In the integrated modules, um, yes, at some particular point when you see integration, um, we'll use vancomycin because I'm one of those ID people too. Um, as Dr. Sarati showed you, it integrates into your decision making on what um, drug you would choose for a person or what the side effect could be. So your learning process does integrate and um, you will have to know that pharmacology, that medicinal chemistry, that pharmacokinetics to truthfully answer some of those case-based questions. Um, so hopefully that's a very complex way, an integrated way of answering that question, but hopefully that kind of clarified it a little. All right, what other questions? And again, if you want to, feel free to unmute if you'd like to speak out loud. I know some of us can't see everybody, you know, all the participants on the screen. So if you'd like to unmute or use the chat box, please do. So can someone talk about the white coat ceremony and do we wear them to all of our classes? I'll open that up for you all. <laughs> um, I, I can take that question. Um, the white coat ceremony is um, when all of our incoming students, so class of 2026 for the fall, uh, will be getting their white coat. And the white coat is really signifies your entrance into the professional career. Um, you also wear your white coat to any of the convocations, required convocations, as well as any of the labs. This is to kind of help bring you into the profession wearing professional clothes to kind of get you in the, that, that sense of you're doing your duty to your patients, you know, that sense of professionalism that you will be um, kind of instilling that, um, that sense um, when you go into um, the courses and throughout your curriculum. The white coat ceremony is a huge event. Um, it kind of caps off at the end of our new student orientation. It's usually on a Friday. That's where we also invite your family members and your supporters to come because they are going to be at the big support throughout your curriculum here. So it's that you other colleges does it differently. U of H, we want to give you that white coat so that you can own it and feel that um, that kind of that welcome into our profession. So uh, during that time, you have lots of faculty to, to introduce themselves and welcome you into the profession as well. So that's usually that first um, that capping of our new student orientation. It's a lovely, very formalized um, ceremony. To add to the white coat, you will be wearing your white coat to all your ifis and apis in your rotation. It's your professional identity. So having to wear that in the labs uh, and periodically for our formal events here will help you transition into when you will be wearing it on a daily basis when you're out on rotations and identify you as a uh, pharmacy professional. Thank you. And who's going to take this tough question here? What's the toughest semester in your opinion? 
I think it's going to vary from person to person. Um, I think your first year, what is tough um, is the transition in and the amount of hours, um, especially your spring semester is 16 credit hours um, in that P1 spring semester. The other um, a transition semester, I would say, is probably that P2 fall uh, semester as you transition into the modules, as well as you have the longitudinal courses. But I also have to say it's individual for each student as to what they can manage, what they can balance out, because I said what it says, what well, are you able to work while in school? But one of the things I ha we have to remind you is your priority and your work really is College of Pharmacy. It is going to pharmacy school and your classes will start at eight and can go all the way till five o'clock. So take that into consideration when you think of your study time and how you can balance working with it. Um, a lot of students do try to balance too much and that is when we see them get into trouble um, as well as getting involved in organizations. There's so many different things that come together. And I think a follow up to that was uh, typically how many classes will a student take per day and are there are classes every day. So pretty much classes are uh, Monday through Thursday are how we have the schedule set up are the days that you have classes and our classes are kind of set up where um, primarily um, it, it, it depends on the particular day, but you can have multiple classes that will go all the way up to about noon and then you have a break from noon to 1.30 and usually you have organizations, convocations, you have your lunch at that time and then at 1.30 you either go back into classes um, depending on what semester goes, it, it, it depends on how late you go, but on average you see everything done around 4.30ish. Um, a lot of times you have the labs, the Mersels, as Dr. Sarati was talking about, those are in your afternoons, and they usually go from 1.30 to 4.30, and then you'll have other different lab days where you might be split, where you may be in the morning lab versus an afternoon lab, so you will have a variety. Your Fridays, you aren't, you have a few Fridays that you're actually off, but I will put a plug in. That's when you get to see your students helping as we recruit new students coming in. And that's a huge um, help um, for us as a college. But that is also our exam day. So a large amount of our exams also take place on Fridays. All right, thank you, Dean Coyle. All right, we have just a couple more minutes with everyone. Uh, so again, if you do have questions, Please let us know. There was a question about block scheduling. And I can answer that one. Yeah. Um, yes. Yeah. So, so when you get into the modules, well, your first year, everything is pretty much the whole entire semester. So it's what you're used to for traditional courses where a two credit, a, 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 again, we'll go through. When you get to the modules, the modules and the, depending on if it's a two credit hour module or a three credit hour module, um, and it varies from semester to semester. But yes, you can have anywhere from a three week to a five week time frame that you are, and that's the large bulk of what your semester is. So if I, I think a good example to take would be, let's look at the fall of the P2 year. Your longitudinal classes are pharmacokinetics, literature evaluation, um, principles of IPE, and then your skills labs. Um, and so then the other time frame, of which is a large portion of it, is what are your modules. So um, a lot of times you'll have three hours, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, say, of modules in the morning that you're taking those classes each day. Um, and then at the end of five weeks, you finish with that module and then move on to the next one. But one of the things we really want to reiterate is even though you're finishing off that disease state module, that knowledge is very imperative as you carry over into that next module. Because when you do that renal module, learning how drugs are cleared renally, renal disease directly affects how you can treat gastrointestinal diseases, um, the drugs you can choose, how they're cleared. So everything builds upon each other. Thank you, Dean Coyle. I am gonna go ahead and wrap us all up there.
Uh, I know that there's technically a minute left, but I do have a short survey for everyone uh, who's in attendance. I should say for all uh, attendees, not the speakers. All right, so I am gonna drop a short survey in the chat box for everyone who's in attendance today. And uh, if you have additional questions, there's an open-ended question at the end of that survey. Please put it in there and we will use that to continue to make future content so that we can make sure that we are continuing to serve you in every way that we can. Uh, and to our faculty panel, thank you all for being here and assisting us with this presentation. This is the first time we've done a, a curriculum session this in depth. Uh, and I feel like we've probably just kind of touched on bits and pieces of it and we could probably do future sessions uh, as we move along. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, for doing this. Uh, yes, we are recording this and there will be an edited version that's uh, potentially shorter uh, so that we can continue to post that on our website and all of you can view that in the future, okay? Uh, so we'll get that out as soon as possible, hopefully early next week. All right. Thank you again, faculty. Everyone have a great day. Enjoy your weekend.